Hallelujah. Are you ready to get into Yah's Word today? I am as well. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to start with chapter 14 and verse 3 in just a moment. And this is what I'm calling this message today. Should believers in Yeshua follow the dietary instructions of the Torah? That's a big question going around today in religion. Should believers in Yeshua follow the dietary instructions of the Torah? We're going to start off by reading in the Torah what uh, most of these dietary instructions are. And then we're going to get over into the good news accounts. And then we're going to go over to the writings of the emissaries. And we're going to find out if Yeshua really abolished the dietary instructions. And then we'll also talk about Shaul, the Apostle Paul. Did Shaul abolish the dietary instructions? And should all of us as believers in Yeshua be following the dietary instructions of the Torah? So Deuteronomy chapter 14, beginning with verse 3, says, Do not eat whatever is abominable. So there are some things that are abominable that we should not eat. Let's find out what they are. Verse 4 These are the living creatures which you do eat, ox, sheep, and goat, deer, and gazelle, and roebuck, and wild goat, and mountain goat, and antelope, and mountain sheep, and every beast that has a split hoof divided in two, chewing the cud among the beasts, you do eat. So these are the prerequisites. Every beast that has a split hoof divided in two and chewing the cud, these are the ones you eat. All right, so if if they have a divided hoof but they don't chew the cud, you don't eat it. If they do not have a divided hoof but they do chew the cud, you don't eat it. You have to have both, a divided hoof and chewing the cud. Verse 7. But of those chewing the cud or those having a split hoof completely divided, you do not eat. In other words, if there's just one and not both, you don't eat it. Such as these, the camel, the hare, the rabbit, for they chew the cud but do not have a split hoof. They are unclean for you. And the pig is unclean for you. You say, oh, I love my ham. I love my bacon. Well, you need to listen. The pig is unclean for you. Because it has a split hoof, but does not chew the cud. You do not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcasses. These you do eat of all that are in the waters. So what can we eat out of the waters? All that have fins and scales you do eat. All right, so you have two prerequisites. They have to have fins and scales. They can't have one or the other. They have to have both. And whatever does not have fins and scales, you do not eat. It is unclean for you. Verse 11. Any clean bird you do eat, but these you do not eat. The eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, and the red kite, and the falcon, and the buzzard after their kinds, and every raven after its kind, and the ostrich, and the night hawk, and the seagull and the hawk after their kinds, the little owl and the great owl and the white owl and the pelican and the carrion vulture and the fisher owl and the stork and the heron after its kind and the hoopoe and the bat and every creeping insect that flies is unclean for you. They are not Eaten. So you can get over in Leviticus chapter 11. It'll go into more detail concerning the insects that fly. We know that certain locusts were clean because Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, ate locusts and wild honey. Verse 20, any clean bird you do eat, do not eat whatever dies of itself. Give it to the stranger who is within your gates to eat it or sell it to a foreigner For you are a set-apart people to Yah your Elohim. So eating clean is part of being set apart. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. We're not going to get into that today in this message. We know in rabbinical uh, kosher, 
concepts. Uh, they want to separate milk and meat, but this means exactly what it says. Don't cook a young goat in its mother's milk. All right, so just a brief explanation about why these animals uh, are unclean and why you shouldn't eat them. Uh, the creatures who are the land sweepers, in other words, they eat dead and decaying material. They clean up what is dead and dirty and filthy like a pig will eat anything. Uh, the sweepers, the land sweepers, don't eat them. They're loaded with toxins. And then the, the water sweepers, those that, that eat things that are dead on the bottom of the ocean or that are on the bottom of the lakes or the rivers. They eat the dead material. They eat the toxic things. They're, they're sweepers, so we don't eat those. Same with the birds. Uh, those birds that we just mentioned, they're the birds that eat roadkill and they eat things that have died on their own and, and they're just loaded with toxins. And so the Almighty is wise. He wants His people to be healthy. He also wants His people to be set apart. And so He's saying, for, for those of us who want to be the set-apart people of Elohim, uh, don't eat these things. They're unclean to you. Now, did Yeshua come along and, and change all that? Did He come along and say that if a person eats something unclean, uh, that that is not defiling of that person? Because that's what you hear religion say. Well, let's take a look. Matthew chapter 15, starting with verse 1. Then there came to Yeshua scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem, saying, why do your taught ones transgress the tradition of the elders? Now, this is very important because this is not talking about the laws of Elohim, the Torah of Elohim, or the written scripture. This is talking about the traditions of the elders, the, the made-up rules and regulations of religion. And so these scribes and Pharisees were questioning Yeshua and wanting to know, why don't your taught ones, those that follow you, why don't they keep the traditions of the elders? It goes on to say, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. All right, so they had a special way of washing their hands, the Pharisees, before they ate. Now, obviously, bread is, is clean. So this is not talking about eating something that's unclean. This is talking about eating something clean with unwashed hands. And the Pharisees thought that if you didn't wash your hands in a certain way, then your hands were defiled. And if your hands are defiled, then when you pick up bread, you defile the bread. And when you eat bread with unwashed hands, then you defile yourself. Now that's their thinking. What is Yeshua going to say about that? Verse 3, But he, Yeshua, answering, said to them, Why do you also transgress the command of Elohim? So he's not talking about transgressing the traditions of the elders. He's talking about transgressing the command of of Elohim, the very written word of Yah. Why do you also transgress the command of Elohim? Because of your tradition. In other words, you want to keep your tradition. And so you're actually breaking the Torah of Elohim in an effort to keep your tradition. Verse 4. For Elohim has commanded, saying, Respect your father and your mother. That's one of the ten words. That's a Torah commandment. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. That's also a Torah commandment. But you say, now keep that in mind, but you say, but you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me has been dedicated, is certainly released from respecting his father or his mother. In other words, the the support that you would have given your elderly parents in obedience to the commandment, you don't give them that financial support. Instead, you take it and give it to the religious establishment. And the religious establishment tells you if you give them the financial support that you would have given your elderly father and mother, then you're released from the commandment of Elohim. Well, that sounds like a racket to me. And they are most definitely doing what Yeshua said they were doing. They're breaking the commands of Elohim in an effort to keep their traditions. He goes on to say in verse 6, So you have nullified the command of Elohim by your tradition. So Elohim says one thing, 
And they were saying something else. Verse 7, Yeshua said, hypocrites. Yeshayahu rightly prophesied about you saying, this people draw near to me with their mouth and respect me with their lips. It's all lip service. But their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me. In other words, their, their worship doesn't count. It's, it's in vain. In vain do they worship me. Teaching as teachings. Another translation says teaching as doctrines. The commands of men. So they're just teaching the commands of men. They're not teaching the commands of Elohim. And calling the crowd near, he said to them, hear and understand. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles the man. But that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles the man. All right, this is talking about eating bread with unwashed hands. So he's saying it's not that you're eating something that is clean, like bread, with unwashed hands. And because you didn't follow the traditions of the elders, you have defiled the bread. And so by eating the bread, you're defiling yourself. That's not it. He says, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles the man, but that which comes out of the mouth. This defiles the man. Then his taught ones came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees stumbled when they heard this word? They didn't like the fact that he was teaching against their traditions. And he did that. He did that quite often. See, his calling was to bring people back to the written Torah because he was the living Torah. And he came to demonstrate how to live out the Torah by favor in the spirit. So he was bringing people back to the written Torah. And so in that calling, he called out these traditions of men because they were breaking the commands of Elohim in an effort to keep their traditions. Verse 13, but he answering said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be uprooted. He's talking about those people in religious authority. Verse 14, leave them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. So if those who are following the leaders don't have the wherewithal to study and find out what the word really says, and those who are leading the followers are teaching traditions of men and not the commands of Elohim, they're both going to end up in a ditch. And that's what happened. Verse 50, and Kepha, this is Peter, answering said to him, Explain this parable to us. And Yeshua said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not understand that whatever enters into the mouth goes into the stomach and is cast out in the sewer? I want you to keep in mind that phrase, and is cast out or is eliminated, is expelled. All right? But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and these defile the man. For out of the heart come forth wicked reasonings, murders, adulteries, whorings, thefts, false witnessings, slanders. These defile the man. Here it is. Keep this in mind because this is the context. It's been the context the whole time. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. So the entire context of this passage was eating bread. Bread is clean. Eating bread without washing your hands the way that the Pharisees wanted you to wash your hands because of the traditions of the elders. If you didn't do that, they believed that your hands were defiled. And by touching the bread, the bread was defiled. By putting it into your mouth and it going inside of you, then you were defiled. And Yeshua was teaching against that. He's saying it's what comes out of the heart, what comes out of the man that defiles him. But he says to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. So this has nothing to do with Yeshua making unclean meat clean. Although that's what religion loves to say. When you talk to people in religion, they just love their bacon. They just love their unclean Items that they want to eat all the time. And so they'll go here and show you 
you know, and say Yeshua made unclean meat clean. That's not what he's saying here at all. He ends this passage by saying, to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. There was a thought in those days that if you ate with unwashed hands, you open yourself up to demon possession. And so he was coming against that. So let's go over to Mark chapter 7. We'll pick up with verse 1. And this is covering the same story, but it has some other details that are important for us to take a look at. Mark chapter 7, verse 1. And the Pharisees and some of the scribes assembled to him, having come from Jerusalem, and seeing some of his taught ones eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands. They said their hands were defiled. The scribes and the Pharisees said that, not Yeshua. And seeing some of his taught ones eat bread with defiled, they said defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Yehudim, all the Jews, do not eat unless they wash their hands thoroughly or in a specific way, a certain way, holding fast or hanging on to the tradition of the elders. And coming from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions which they have received and hold fast. These are the heavy burdens hard to bear that Yeshua spoke of as well. These are the man-made rules and regulations that made it so difficult. It says the washing of cups and utensils and copper vessels and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your taught ones not walk according to the tradition of the elders? I mean, that was so important to them. Why don't you toe the line? Why don't you keep our extra rules and regulations? But they eat, they eat bread with unwashed hands. Verse 6, And he, Yeshua answering, said to them, Well did Yeshiyahu prophesy concerning you hypocrites, as it has been written, This people respect me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain do they worship me, teaching as teachings the commands of men. Verse 8, forsaking the command of Elohim, you hold fast the tradition of men. You break the Torah of Elohim while hanging fast to the tradition of men. And he said to them, well, do you set aside the command of Elohim in order to guard your tradition? You're breaking the commands of Elohim to keep your tradition. For Moshe said, respect your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say... See, for Moshe said, in other words, it says in the written Torah, that's verse 10, verse 11 says, but you say, the scripture says one thing and you say something else. And that's not just for the scribes and the Pharisees of that day. That's for religious people today. The scripture says one thing, but religion says something else. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is a gift, you no longer let him do any matter at all for his father or his mother, nullifying the word of Elohim through your tradition, which you have handed down. You're handing down traditions that nullify the word of Elohim. And many such traditions you do. And calling the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is no matter or there is nothing that enters a man from outside which is able to defile him. Keep in mind that when a Jew thought about actually eating something, that food, broma in Greek, that was a substance that met the dietary instructions of the Torah. A Jew would never put something unclean in his mouth. So that's the context that Yeshua is speaking from. When he says there is nothing or there is no matter that enters a man, he's talking about something clean that you would put in your mouth. He's not talking about something unclean. He's not talking about making unclean meat clean. He's talking within the context of eating bread with unwashed hands. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which is able to defile him, but it is what comes out of him that defiles the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. 
And when he went from the crowd into a house, his taught ones asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, are you also without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside is unable to defile him? In other words, bread eaten with unwashed hands. Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purging all foods. Verse 19 has been a subject of controversy for many, 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 many years because certain English translations misinterpret this passage altogether. I was looking through some English translations today and I saw one that says, thus purifying all foods. All right, let's, let's read this, keeping that translation in mind. Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside is unable to defile him because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? Now, I'm going to be very careful as I talk about this, but I want to ask the question, is there anything pure about what is eliminated from the body? Why would the word be pure there? Pure, thus purifying all foods. Is elimination from the body, is that pure? The word here is the word purge. That's the proper translation because it makes complete sense. Because it does not enter into his heart but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purging all foods. Now, if you look at the word foods here, in the Greek, it's broma. And again, broma is something eaten by a Jewish person. The only thing eaten by a Jewish person is what satisfies the dietary instructions of the Torah. If it doesn't satisfy the dietary instructions of the Torah, it's not food. All right, so this is not talking about eating something unclean. This is talking about eating something clean with unwashed hands. And the scribes and the Pharisees say that if you eat bread, which is clean, with unwashed hands, your hands are defiled, you defile the bread, you eat it, you defile yourself. And you may open yourself up to demon possession. And so Yeshua is rebuking that. So this is the proper translation because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purging all foods, purging from the body, the elimination of all foods. All right. I read another translation is one of the English translations. It says making all meats fit to eat. That is so incorrect. Making all meats fit to eat. It runs completely contrary to the dietary instructions. It runs completely contrary to what Yeshua taught. If you want to get an idea of what he taught about the Torah, go to Matthew chapter 5, read verses 17 through 19. All right, Yeshua did not make all meats fit to eat. This is where religion just goes, oh, look at that. Let's run out and get a ham sandwich. It's a misinterpretation, it's an error. We've been talking about men wanting to keep their traditions and breaking the commands of Elohim. In essence, that's what's still going on. People break the commands of Elohim to keep their traditions about all meat being made clean. In other words, unclean meat being made clean by Yeshua. So they're all excited about eating their bacon and their ham and whatever else they eat that's unclean. Verse 20. And he said, Yeshua said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil reasonings, adulteries, whorings, murders, thefts, greedy desires, wickednesses, deceit, indecency, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these wicked matters come from within and defile a man. And so... That's the word of Yeshua on this matter. Let's go over to Acts chapter 10. And let's take a look at another passage that religion likes to say, well, this tells us that, that all 
meats were cleansed. And this is the vision that Shimon Kephar, Simon Peter, received. And so the question is, did Peter's vision mean that all meat was made clean? Let's take a look. Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. Now there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a captain of what is called the Italian regiment, dedicated and fearing Elohim with all his household, doing many kind deeds to the people and praying to Elohim always. He clearly saw in a vision about the ninth hour of the day a messenger of Elohim coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius, and looking intently at him and becoming afraid, he said, What is it, master? And he said to him, Your prayers and your kind deeds have come up for a remembrance before Elohim. Verse 5. And now send men to Yafo. So what is he going to send? He's going to send men. Keep that in mind. And now send men to Yafo. And send for Shimon, who is also called Kepha. That's Simon Peter. He is staying with Shimon, with another Simon, a leather tanner whose house is by the sea. And when the messenger who spoke to him went away, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a dedicated soldier from among those who waited on him continually. And having explained to them all, as three men, he sent them to Yafo. Keep that in mind, three men. And on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Kepha went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became hungry and wished to eat. But while they were preparing, while they were preparing his food, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heaven opened and a certain vessel like a great sheet bound at the four corners. So it's like a bundle all bound at the top at the four corners. Descending to him and let down to the earth in which were all kinds of four footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping creatures and the birds of the heaven. Now you get the idea if you just kind of haphazardly read through this, you don't think deeply, that these are just unclean animals. But it's not just unclean animals. It's clean and unclean animals. And so there's all kinds, it says, all kinds of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping creatures and the birds of the heaven. And a voice came to him, Rise up, Kepha, slay and eat. Now notice Kepha's response. Now, this is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. It could have been as many as 10 years after the resurrection and ascension of Yeshua. Notice what Kepha says. This is Peter. He said, not at all, Master, because I have never eaten whatever is common or unclean. Let's stop right there and say, there was probably not anyone closer to Yeshua than Peter. And if Yeshua would have taught against the dietary instructions at any point in his ministry, then Peter would have heard it. And Peter would have understood. And if he didn't understand what Yeshua was teaching, he would have asked. So that Yeshua could have clarified that there's coming a point in time when Yeshua, when he's going to make all unclean meat clean. So you could just eat anything you want to. If he taught that, Peter would have known. But we see that years after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Yeshua, that Peter still has not eaten anything common or unclean. Notice what he said. Not at all, Master, because I have never, to this day, I have never eaten whatever is common or unclean. So, the unclean animals in the sheep, we know what they are because we can read it right here in the Torah. What is common? Common is an idea that something clean, an animal that is clean, can become common or defiled because of its close interaction with an unclean animal. So you have this great sheet and the four corners are gathered up at the top and it's a bundle and so you have clean and unclean animals in this bundle and they're writhing about and moving about and rubbing up against each other. 
And so Peter understood that concept. And so he responds to the voice and says, not so or not at all, master, because I have never eaten whatever is common or unclean. So there's nothing in that bundle that I can eat because there are unclean animals in that bundle. And there are clean animals, but because they've been in direct contact with the unclean animals, they're now common, so I can't eat them. Verse 15, And a voice came to him again the second time. Now notice, this is very, very important. What Elohim has cleansed, you do not consider common. This is where religion says, you see, all unclean meat has been cleansed. Elohim has cleansed all those unclean animals. And so you can eat anything in that sheet because all the unclean animals are cleansed. But Peter didn't see it that way. He was still rather confused at this point. What Elohim has cleansed, you do not consider common. Now I'm going to move ahead a little bit and uh, kind of give you some insight. We're going to get there in a moment in the scriptures. But this is not talking about meat at all. This is talking about men. What Elohim has cleansed, you do not consider common. All right? So the Jews, keeping the Torah, were considered clean. And the Gentiles were considered unclean. And so Yeshua, when Yeshua died on the tree... He positionally cleansed all of humanity. Now, you have to appropriate that cleansing by believing upon Him. But positionally, everyone had the right to believe in Yeshua and be considered clean. And so Elohim, through the death of Yeshua on the stake and His shed blood, positionally cleansed all men. And so notice what the voice is saying here. What Elohim has cleansed you do not consider common. Now, in a moment when he's explaining that the revelation came to him and he began to understand what this is all about, he's going to say that he understood then that what Elohim had cleansed, you're not to call common or unclean. All right, so let's look at verse 16. It says, and this took place three times. How many men were coming to the door? Three men. Three times, and the vessel was taken back to the heaven. And while Kepha was doubting, see, religion is so confident that this is talking about meat. But Kepha, who's a pillar in the early congregation, one that Yeshua said, I'm going to give you the keys of the rain, he wasn't so sure. He was still doubting for a while, he was trying to figure it out. Religion is so certain that it's talking about meat. While Kepha was doubting within himself about what the vision might mean, look, the men who had been sent from Cornelius, having asked for the house of Shimon, stood at the gate. And calling out, they inquired whether Shimon, also known as Kepha, was staying there. And as Kepha was thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him. So he was still thinking about the vision. He wasn't sure. He was trying to figure out what it meant. Then the Spirit spoke to him. See, three men seek you. Three men. But rise up, go down, and go with them, not doubting at all, for I have sent them. These are three Gentile men. Now there's a, a tradition, there's a rule of religion that said that the Jews were not to have fellowship with the Gentiles. And so this was a big deal. He heard from the Spirit that these three Gentile men were seeking him, and he was to rise up, go down, and go with them, not doubting. It says not doubting at all. Notice, for I have sent them. So Kepha went down to the men, Notice it doesn't say anything about meat. Kepha didn't get some revelation and run out to the local deli and get a ham sandwich. It's not talking about meat. This is talking about men. So Kepha went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Look, I am the one you seek. Why have you come? 
And they said, Cornelius, the captain, a righteous man and one who fears Elohim and well spoken of by the entire nation of the Yehudim or the Jews was instructed by a set apart messenger to send for you to his house and to hear words from you. So inviting them in. Now, now I know that he understood what this was about at this point because he would have never invited these Gentile men into the house because it ran contrary to the tradition. They weren't supposed to have fellowship with the Gentiles. It says inviting them in. He invited them into the house. He housed them. Well, if he houses them, he's got to feed them. So not only is he bringing them into the house, but, but he's, he's feeding them. And they're eating in the house. And on the next day, Kepha went away with them. And some brothers from Yafo went with him. Verse 24, and the following day they entered into Caesarea. And Cornelius was waiting for them, having called together his relatives and close friends. So there's a lot of Gentiles in the house. And it came to be that when Kepha entered... Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and bowed before him. But Kepha raised him up saying, stand up. I myself am also a man. And talking with him, he went in and found many who had come together. So this is breaking the tradition completely. He's doing what the tradition said he shouldn't do. What the rules, the religious rules and regulations said he wasn't supposed to be doing any of this. But he did it because the spirit spoke to him and he saw that vision. And he said to them, you know that a Yehudi man is not allowed to associate with or go to one of another race. So now he's talking about the religious rule, the tradition. But Elohim has shown me that I should not call. Here it is. That I should not call any man. He's talking about men common or unclean. Now think about it. They thought that the Jews who kept the Torah were clean, that the Gentiles were unclean. And then they thought that if they had any fellowship with an unclean man, they would become common. And so Kepha is saying here that Elohim has made it clear to him through the revelation, through the speaking of the spirit, that he should not call any man common or Unclean. So what is this revelation all about? What is this vision all about? It's about men, not meat. It is so clear when you get beyond the pet doctrines of religion, the traditions of religion, that this is talking about men and not meat. Peter, when he got this revelation, didn't just run out and grabbed up some pork ribs and, and have a big feast on something unclean? What did he do? He went with these Gentile men. He went into the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. He met with the friends and the relatives of, of Cornelius. And he spoke to them. He did all the things that the tradition said he shouldn't do. That the religious rule said he shouldn't do. That's what he did. Because it was about men and not about meat. Verse 29. That is why I came without hesitation when I was sent for. So I ask, why have you sent me? And then look at Acts chapter 10, starting with verse 44. Because Kepha goes on and he preaches the good news of Yeshua. And we see in verse 44, while Kepha was still speaking these words, the set apart spirit fell upon all those hearing the word, on all those former Gentiles who just believed. And those of the circumcision, the Jews, who believed were astonished as many as came with Kepha because there were several that came with Kepha because the gift of the set apart spirit had been poured out on the nations or on the Gentiles also for they were hearing them speaking with tongues and extolling Elohim. Then Kepha answered, is anyone able to forbid water that these should not be immersed who have received the set apart spirit even as also we? And he commanded them to be immersed in the name of Yeshua Messiah. Then they asked him to remain a few days. And then look at Acts chapter 11, picking up with verse 1. There's some really interesting things in this passage. It says, And the emissaries 
or those called the apostles, and brothers who were in Yehuda heard that the nations, these former Gentiles, also received the word of Elohim. And when Kepha went up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision, the Jews, were contending with him. That tradition had run so deep. Those extra laws and rules of religion had paralyzed them to the point to where they couldn't even think beyond them. And they were contending with Kepha, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them? There is no Torah commandment anywhere that says that a Jew is not supposed to have fellowship with a Gentile. As a matter of fact, a Jewish person is supposed to be the light of the world. Supposed to take the commands and the Torah of Elohim to the nations of the world, not keep it to themselves. But this tradition, this religious rule was keeping them from fulfilling the purpose that Elohim had called them to. And so when they found out that Kepha had gone into the house of a Gentile and ate with them and fellowshiped with them and shared the word with them, they were contending with him. They, they couldn't believe it. They said, you went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them? But Kepha began and set it forth in order, saying, I was in the city of Jaffa praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision, a certain vessel descending like a great sheet let down from the heaven by four corners. It was a bundle. And it came to me. Having looked into it, I perceived, and I saw four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping creatures and the birds of heaven. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise up, Kepha, slay and eat. But I said, Not at all, Master. Again, this was probably years after the resurrection and ascension of Yeshua. Because whatever is common, in other words, this idea of being something clean being defiled by direct contact with something unclean, or unclean has never entered into my mouth. So even after the resurrection and ascension of Yeshua, after the outpouring of the Spirit, Kepha was still keeping the dietary instructions. And he's a pillar in the congregation of belief. He's still keeping the dietary instructions years after the resurrection and ascension of Yeshua, after the outpouring of the Spirit, still keeping the dietary instructions. Now, if we were to go back and say, well, if we're supposed to follow Yeshua, he kept the dietary instructions. And then if we're supposed to follow those early emissaries, well, we know Kepha kept the dietary instructions. And I'm going to show you in a bit that Shaul did too. And all those early emissaries, they kept the Torah, they kept the dietary instructions. So if we're supposed to follow the example of Yeshua and the early emissaries, well, they kept the dietary instructions. Verse 8 again, But I said, Not at all, Master, because whatever is common or unclean has never entered into my mouth. And the voice answered me again from the heaven, What Elohim has cleansed you do not consider common. Talking about men. And this took place three times. And all were drawn up again into the heaven. And see, immediately three men, happened three times, and three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit said to me to go with them, not doubting at all. And these six brothers, so there were six Jews that went with him, also went with me. And we went into the man's house. And he told us how he had seen a messenger standing in his house who said to him, send men to Yafo and call for Shimon, who is also called Kepha, who shall speak to you words by which you shall be saved. See, that wouldn't happen if, if he was unable to go into his house, if he was unable to speak to him, if he was unable to fellowship with him. So this horrible tradition of men had to be brought down for the great commandment of Yeshua to be fulfilled, to go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature. Verse 14, Who shall speak to you words by which you shall be saved, you and all your house? And as I began to speak, the set-apart spirit fell upon them, 
as upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the words of the master, how he said, Yochanan indeed immersed in water, but you shall be immersed in the set apart spirit. So if Elohim gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the master Yeshua, how was I able to withstand Elohim? Is this talking about meat? No, it's talking about men. Verse 18, and having heard this, they were silent and praised Elohim, saying, then Elohim has indeed also given to the nations repentance to life. And that's what this vision was all about. Nothing more, nothing less. Acts chapter 15 and verse 5. And some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them. All right, so Shaul is out. He's preaching. He's telling the good news to all those in the Gentile world. And many Gentiles were believing and becoming believers. And so you had some in the Pharisee sect who were saying for the Gentiles or the nations to be saved, then they needed to be circumcised or convert to Judaism and keep the Torah of Moshe. Well, if you ask a Jew even today, how many Torahs are there? Uh, they'll say two. There's a written Torah and there's a, an oral Torah. We're talking about, when we say oral Torah, we're talking about the traditions of the elders, all the added rules and regulations that Yeshua was rebuking. And so that's the situation here in Acts 15. Again, verse 5, And some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees rose up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them, these Gentiles, former Gentiles coming to the belief, and to command them to keep the Torah of Moshe. And the emissaries and elders came together to look into this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Kepha rose up and said to them, Men, brothers, you know that a good while ago Elohim chose among us that by my mouth the nations should hear the word of the good news and believe. And Elohim, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the set-apart spirit as also to us, and made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by belief. See, when Yeshua died on the stake, all human beings were positionally cleansed. And then we appropriate that cleansing by belief. Now then, why do you try Elohim by putting a yoke on the neck of the taught ones, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? This is not talking about the written Torah. This is talking about all the added rules and regulations, the heavy burdens hard to bear that Yeshua was talking about. That's the great yoke that he's talking about here. Verse 10 again. Now then, why do you try Elohim by putting a yoke on the neck of the taught ones? Why are you saying that these former Gentiles who have believed ought to convert to Judaism, receive the mark of conversion, which is circumcision, and then keep not only the written Torah, but the oral Torah that they were still pretty much a slave to at that, at that point. It says, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But through the favor of the Master Yeshua Messiah, we trust to be saved in the same way as they. And all the crowd was silent and were listening to Barnaba and Shaul declaring how many miracles and wonders Elohim did among the nations through them. And after they were silent, Yaakov answered saying, men, brothers, listen to me. So Yaakov is a pillar in the congregation there in Jerusalem. Verse 14, Shimon has declared how Elohim first visited the nations to take out of them a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this as it has been written. After this, I shall return and rebuild the booth of Dawid, which has fallen down. And I shall rebuild its ruins and I shall set it up so that the remnant of mankind, a remnant of the nations, shall seek Yah even all the nations on whom my name has been called, says Yah, who is doing this, who has made this known from of old. Verse 19, therefore I judge 
that we should not trouble those from among the nations who are turning to Elohim. This is so important. These are first steps. These Gentiles are turning to Elohim. These are the baby steps. These are the very first steps as they turn to Elohim. Let's not say that they have to convert to Judaism. Let's not send them back to Jerusalem and make them submit to some unbelieving rabbi. Let's not make them receive the mark of conversion, which is circumcision. Let's not say that they not only have to keep the written Torah, but they have to keep the oral Torah. Let's not put that burden on them. It says, let's not trouble those from among the nations who are turning to Elohim, but that we write to them to abstain from the defilements of idols. So they've got to get out of idolatry, get out of those idolatrous temples and uh, practicing those idolatrous ways. Secondly, from whoring as temple prostitution was going on right there in those, those pagan temples. And from what is strangled, they would sacrifice to those false deities. They would strangle animals. That's the way they would do it. Those were sacrifices made to demons. And from blood, then they would eat the sacrifices with the blood still in it. And that, that runs contrary to the Torah. The Torah prohibits eating the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You're not supposed to eat the blood. So these are four things that are beginning steps, early steps, first steps, baby steps, as the Gentiles are leaving that pagan lifestyle and coming into Torah, these are the first things they're to do. They've got to get out of the temples, get out of those pagan temples, abstain from the defilements of idols and from temple prostitution and from offering sacrifices, strangling the animals, offering the demons and eating those sacrifices with the blood in it, which is what they did in the pagan temples. In other words, come out of idolatry, come out of that idolatrous pagan temple worship. All right, so I want to stop right there and say religion will come along and say, well, see, there are only four things that the believing Gentiles, they're not really Gentiles once they believe, the former Gentiles have to do. And these are the four things. Stay away from idols, from whoring, from what is strangled, and from blood. Really, you believe that? You believe that that's all a believer who's not a Jew ethnically has to do those four things? What about the 10 words? Do you not believe those 10 words? What about all of the commandments that we read about in what's called the quote New Testament? There's a whole lot more than four. So when you say there's just four things, you're speaking out of your ignorance. There's not just four things. These are first steps. For them to get to where they need to be, these are the first four things they need to do. Get out of those temples. Stop that pagan worship. Stop that idolatry. All right? And then look at verse 21, because this is where religion just reads right over it, and they don't even understand what's being said here. Verse 21, For from ancient generations, Moshe has, in every city, not just in the cities of Israel, but in every city, the surrounding cities, in all those Gentile-controlled areas, in every city, those proclaiming Him in the synagogues. If you want to find out what the Torah says, you can go into the synagogues. Being read in the congregations every Sabbath. Now, why would he say that? He's saying that to say the very first things that we're going to tell these former Gentiles who have come to believe in Yeshua is that they need to get out of the pagan temples. Stop their idolatry. Stop that temple prostitution. Stop that strangling. Stop eating the blood. And then, if they want to progress, and they should... They need to get into the synagogues and hear the Torah read. Now, why is that important? Because there were no printed Bibles. The only place you could hear the Torah read is, is in the synagogue. So you could get into the synagogue and hear the Torah read, start learning the Torah, and start living the Torah lifestyle. Notice what it says, verse 21. I want to read it again. For from ancient generations, Moshe has in every city, it's everywhere, those proclaiming or preaching or teaching him. In other words, what's in the Torah? Being read in the congregations every Sabbath. So in a nutshell, what Yaakov is saying is, for these Gentiles who are coming to believe, so they become former Gentiles, we're not going to put this heavy burden of conversion to Judaism on them. 
We're not going to tell them they have to receive the mark of conversion, which is circumcision. We're not going to put the, the written Torah and all the heavy burdens hard to bear of the oral Torah on them at this point. It'll overwhelm them. What we're going to tell them to do is to get out of the pagan temples, stop with the idolatry, stop with the temple prostitution, stop with strangling animals, that's offering sacrifices to demons. Stop eating those sacrifices with the blood in it because that runs absolutely contrary to Torah. And then when it's time to progress, they can get into the synagogues, they can listen to the Torah being read, and they can start obeying the word of Elohim. That's what this is saying. It has nothing to do with saying that there's only four things that a believing, quote, Gentile has to do. And keeping the dietary instructions is not on that list. Well, neither is don't murder. That one's not on that list. Don't steal is not on that list. So the idea that there's only four things, that, that's just someone speaking out of their ignorance. So let's quickly go over to Acts chapter 21. And we're going to ask the question and answer the question, did Paul or Shaul eat according to the dietary instructions of the Torah? Did he? Well, let's find out. Acts 21, verse 18. On the following day, Shaul went in with us to Yaakov. So this is Shaul coming into Yaakov or James. And all the elders came. And having greeted them, he was relating one by one what Elohim had done among the nations through his service. So this is Shaul talking about his ministry. And when they heard it, they praised the master. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands of Yehudim there are who have believed, these are believing Jews, and all are ardent for the Torah. These are believing Jews. They believed in Yeshua, and they're ardent for the Torah. They're obeying the written Torah. So that's the example that we have. The early congregation was a congregation of believing Jews who obeyed the Torah. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Yehudim who are among the nations to forsake Moshe, which he was not doing saying not to circumcise the children, nor to walk according to the practices. These were lies. He wasn't teaching that. What then is it? They shall certainly hear that you have come. So do this, what we say to you. We have four men who have taken a vow, according to the Torah. Take them and be cleansed with them and pay their expenses so that they shave their heads. That's all according to the Torah. And all shall know that what they have been informed about you is not so. In other words, so if you obey the Torah in this temple practice along with these four men, then everyone observing will know what they have heard about you is not so. Notice the next phrase. But that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the Torah. Now, Yaakov is a pillar of the early congregation. He's not deceiving here. He's not lying. He's telling the truth. He would not try to promote a deception here. What he is saying is the absolute truth that Shaul, as a believer in Yeshua and as a Jewish person, walked orderly, keeping the Torah. And so there's no doubt that Shaul ate according to the dietary instructions. So we have Yeshua who ate according to the dietary instructions. You say, well, how do you know that? Because Yeshua is our Savior. He can't be our Savior if He was a sinner. Sin is the transgression of the Torah. So if He did not eat according to the dietary instructions, He would have been a sinner. He would have disqualified Himself from being our Savior. So He ate according to the dietary instructions. We know that that Shimon Kepha, Simon Peter, ate according to the dietary instructions. Here we see that Shaul ate according to the dietary instructions. And so the question is, what should we do? Well, what's the example that we have set for us in Scripture? All of those significant people, especially Yeshua, who said, follow me, ate according to the dietary instructions of the Torah. So I want to close out with one final passage that has brought a lot of debate in religion especially. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. What did Paul really say about what to eat? What did he really say about what to eat? Now this passage has been poorly translated, but we're going to 
break it up and extract those important principles to be able to bring clarity to what it's saying. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. But the Spirit distinctly says that in latter times, we're living in the latter times, some shall fall away from the belief, the true belief, not religion, but true Bible belief. This is Shaul writing to Timothy. And he's saying in the latter times, in the latter days, some who call themselves believers are going to fall away from the true belief. They're going to fall away from what the Bible teaches. And they're going to give themselves over to misleading spirits and doctrines of demons. So let's read that. Verse 1 again. But the Spirit distinctly says that in later times some shall fall away from the belief, paying attention to misleading spirits, deceptive spirits, spirits who are deceiving people through false doctrines and teachings of demons. Your Bible may say doctrines of demons. All right, so, so these doctrines or teachings are not coming from the Spirit, but they're coming from demons. What else do we see? In verse 2, we see speaking lies in hypocrisy. And isn't that exactly what Yeshua said those scribes and Pharisees were doing when they were wanting to keep their traditions and they were breaking the commands of Elohim because they wanted to keep their traditions. You think religion is doing that today? You think people are speaking lies and hypocrisy? That they just love their traditions so much that they can't even hear what the scripture actually says about the dietary instructions? They just love their bacon so much that they're unwilling to listen to what the scripture actually says? And they're not speaking the truth that's found in the scripture and they're hypocritical because they say they love Jesus, but they won't follow his example. Did he not say, follow me? Did he not keep the dietary instructions? Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having been branded on their own conscience. Your Bible may say their conscience is seared with a hot iron to where the conscience doesn't work anymore. It's been seared. There's no sense of conscience been seared. It's made ineffective by the lies and the deceptive spirits and the doctrines of demons that have been embraced. Notice it says forbidding to marry. Well, we know the Catholic Church forbids their priests from marrying. So that's one example. Saying to abstain from foods. Remember the context. These are two Jewish men and any time you would speak of the word food, something that is a food is something that satisfies the dietary instructions. So swine is not food. Something that is clean, something that can be eaten. That's the context here. And it's saying that in the latter days, there will be these groups that will forbid people to marry and... They will say that you have to abstain from foods or certain clean substances that you, you could eat. But religion says you can't eat. I think about no meat on Friday. And there are other things. But saying you have to abstain from meat. Not, we're not talking about unclean meat. We're talking about meat. We're talking about clean meat and unclean meat. You have to abstain from that. No meat on Friday. Which Elohim created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now, this is where it all comes down. We really have to pay attention here. It says, forbidding to marry, saying to abstain from foods which Elohim created to be received. Not all animals Elohim created to be received. Some animals he created are not to be received. And the scripture makes it plain. So what he's talking about here are animals that were created to be received with thanksgiving. You don't just thank Elohim for an animal that he says is unclean and eat it. That's what they want to say right here. Saying to abstain from foods which Elohim created to be received 
We know the ones that were created to be received, and we know the ones that he said don't eat. Received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. The truth makes it plain. We're talking about Scripture. The Word is truth. Because every creature of Elohim is good within the context of what we're talking about. We're talking about creatures created to be received. The dietary instructions tell us about those that were created to be received with thanksgiving. By those who believe, you read it in the scripture, you believe it, and know the truth in the Bible. Because those creatures of Elohim are good. And none is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. So even though religion says you have to abstain from that meat, and yet the scripture says that meat is clean. Those clean meats are created to be received with thanksgiving. And the scripture says they're good. And you're not to reject them. You're to receive them with thanksgiving. Verse 5, For it is set apart by the word of Elohim in prayer. It's set apart by the word of Elohim. What word of Elohim are we talking about? We're talking about Deuteronomy 14 and Leviticus 11. The dietary instructions of Elohim. The dietary instructions of Elohim set apart clean from unclean. They set apart the creatures that were created to be received with thanksgiving. Those are the clean ones. And the ones that are not to be eaten. Those are the unclean ones. And so it's, it's really clear once you dig into it. For the clean foods, even though religion says you, you can't have it, the clean foods are set apart by the word of Elohim. Again, if we use the word food, the word food means that they comply with the dietary instructions. Clean animals are set apart by the word of Elohim and prayer. And then notice in verse 6 it says, If you present these matters to the brothers, you shall be a good servant of Yeshua Messiah. Well, we don't really hear this taught very much. But Shaul's saying, if you teach these things, then you're a good servant of Yeshua Messiah being nourished in the words of belief and of the good teaching which you have followed closely. And so, we've covered a lot of ground today, and I think it's, it's plain in Scripture. I know we've made it very, very clear that all of the early examples, Yeshua being the ultimate, Yeshua kept the dietary instructions. Shimon Kepha kept the dietary instructions. Shaul kept the dietary instructions. The early believers kept the dietary instructions. And we see also in the writings of the emissaries where Shaul tells all believers that we are not to reject the clean creatures, the creatures that were created to be received with thanksgiving. And we are not to be put under restriction concerning eating clean foods. In no way does it talk about eating unclean animals. So we started out asking the question, should believers in Yeshua follow the dietary instructions of the Torah? The answer is yes. Yes. If we do, we'll follow Yeshua. And if we do, we'll please the Master. Hallelujah.